Hey guys, I just wanted to give a big shout out to Anchor. Now that it's my second year of podcasting, I thought you all should know that I've only used Anchor to record all of my podcasts. And if you haven't heard about Anchor, it's simply the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There are so many creative creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your own cell phone and your own computer. Anchor then does the hardest part for you. They go ahead and distribute your podcast so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and so many other platforms. Now, I think it's everything you need to make your own podcast in one place. So what are you guys waiting for? Go ahead and download the free Anchor app today and head on over to anchor.fm to get started. Have fun. Hey everyone, welcome back to all my listeners. Hope you're all having a great day so far. And if it's your first time finding me, thanks so much and welcome. Welcome to episode 12 of my fourth season. Today is Wednesday, November 17th, 2021. My name is Sonal Patel and this is the Paint the Medical Picture podcast series. Now the colors are still on fire here in the Midwest and that's inspired me. Well, that's not quite true. I've been inspired for a very, very long time, so I've decided to do something about it. I've started very, very big ideas on a new book, a book of my very own. Life is short, and I have plenty of creativity left in me to leave my mark behind. So let's get right into today's show. In my compliance tip today, I want to bring us back to basics with the CPT coding book for 20. And check out who's on today's Newsworthy with me. I rolled out the red carpet for a true gem that I want to introduce to all of you. Her name is Ebony Etheridge. And I round out today's episode with the remarkable quote on illumination from Aristotle. If you've checked me out on LinkedIn, you know I'm all about compliance and protecting our physicians and valued healthcare professionals when it comes to the business of medicine. I hope this week with me brings you enough to take back to your organizations, to want to dive in deeper, to use my tips and best practices to ensure success. I hope this podcast will help you boost the quality of documentation capture and improve coding accuracy as you help your providers paint the medical picture. If you like what you're hearing, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button now so you don't miss another episode. Write in a review and kindly drop me a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to my podcast. I really love your support. And as always, a friendly disclaimer. Remember, I'm bringing you the news, current healthcare industry news, my compliance tips and recommendations based on my over 10 years of experience in front office, back end, coding, and billing for multi-specialty physicians, compliance, and auditing for both ENM and surgical operative reports. These are my opinions alone and are not to be construed as legal advice. So let's get into a very special newsworthy that features my guest today, Ebony Etheridge. I'm so excited to introduce her to all of you. Now, Ebony is a native of Washington, D.C., where she began her career in the medical field by working in teaching hospitals such as George Washington University and Children's National Medical Center. There, she was recognized for her outstanding customer service and patient relations skills. She relocated to South Florida to work for the University of Miami, where she excelled in medical billing. This sparked her interest in medical coding. She took her skill sets and moved to a corporate environment in the Broward Health System, where she aggressively pursued and became a certified professional coder with what was then known as the American Academy of Professional Coders. That's our AAPC. 
Ebony then joined Acevedo Consulting Incorporated as a coding and compliance analyst in 2019. In this role, she conducted coding and chart reviews for rheumatology, palliative care, and other physician specialties. She also provided compliance guidance. Today, Ebony is also responsible for Medicare and Medicaid credentialing for clients, as well as walking them through the healthcare clinic licensing process with Florida's Agency for Healthcare Administration. Knowing that dealing with federal and state agencies can be confusing, it's her innate customer service skills that serve Ebony and her clients so very well. Now, my goodness, Ebony, that is incredible, incredible work you've done over these years. So welcome. Welcome to my podcast. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with myself and my audience. I'm excited. I'm excited. Now, you know what? You and I have just recently met, right? But I was simply blown away by all of the talent and all the passion that I saw in you. You possess a number of talents, not just our straight up coding and compliance stuff. I was fascinated to learn that you're also an author and you love keeping up and staying fresh with your really creative writing skills. I'd love to know some more about your inspiration there. What's behind this drive that you have? Um, I, I've always journaled. Um, even when I was younger, maybe about six or seven, I remember just writing down little notes and things. And it just took on a life of its own where I started to um, really journal my thoughts and, and what was what I was going on in my life, what was going on in my life. Um, and then those developed into poetry and I expanded into uh, short stories. And then the short stories then developed into novels. Um, and here recently, um, I've been doing article writing. And so I, I did an article um, for that AAPC with their magazine. And, um, and that was a push outside of my scope of writing because more I was writing more so journaling and, and fictional characters and things like that. But to draw it all into the healthcare field and to kind of explain what I do um, on a daily basis um, to prepare the, the providers for the healthcare, healthcare clinic license and to have that all documented, you know, that was a that was a big task for me. So yeah, so that's how I kind of went on that journey. That's incredible. That's incredible. And you know what? The writing skills take us very far in our careers, right? So I always find it to be a very good thing when I talk to folks like you um, who have a knack for writing and getting their thoughts down, which can be published so it can help other people in whatever their industry is, right? So I know that AAPC article is a gem. It's really, really good in helping not only coders, but it also helps our physicians understand more greatly how to begin the process of starting a practice, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I love it, I love it. So now along that same vein, let's move on to my second question. Mm -hmm. Now, I know I'm relatively new to you, but on my podcast, I'd like to bring on guests and get to know them a bit deeper and hear about their journeys. So we all have a past and a history. So if you can, I would hope you could share some of the steps you took to get you here today. I hope you can share something about your journey. Absolutely. I was um, pregnant with my first daughter back in, she was born in 2007, 2000, she was born in 1997. So um, I started in healthcare maybe about 1996. I remember being pregnant with her and I started out with just doing um, like the medical records department. And so um, the medical records department drove me into uh, George Washington University. And, and it was such a great opportunity there at George Washington University. They allowed me to take classes. Um, they just expanded my knowledge of healthcare that I just otherwise wouldn't have even considered, you know, at the time. Um, and so 
I, I went for medical records and then I began to do some like form of scheduling for um, the neurological surgery group that was there in the medical uh, facility that we worked in. And so learning the terms, um, so it's different than working in medical records because you, you see the charts, but you're not really reading and dig digesting the charts or the diagnosis or what's going along with it. But then when I moved to the scheduling department, I was able to put together, okay, so for this diagnosis, the, they're doing this for the patient, you know, and, and to look at the charts and, and actually get into them and review them. Um, so when a patient was going through surgery there at our facility, um, it's certain steps that they had to take in the process of getting on the schedule, first of all, and then the things that they had to do before their surgical procedures. And I found that all fascinating. And so I took a deeper dive into that. Um, I went on to work at Children's National Medical Center and that, that expanded my knowledge even more because um, I, I worked there. We was in the collections department. Um, so I was able to see more of the claims and, and, and what had been built for the patients at that time. And so I was able to take that knowledge um, from the charts and then from the claims. And I moved on here to where I am now in South Florida to University of Miami. And um, the uni with the University of Miami, my mind started working um, because I was in the billing department at the time. And so you're taking the surgical scheduling and then you're taking the billing, um, the collections, and then you're putting it together with now billing, you know, so it's all coming together full scope now at this point. And I had a great, such a great opportunity at the University of Miami um, where they allowed me to take courses and this just expanded my knowledge more. You know, it allowed me to grow and expand and be around so many culturally different people than what I had been used to in Washington, D.C. Um, unfortunately, uh, my family and I decided to move about two hours away to a town called Port St. Lucie. So the commute back to the University of Miami and working, it was just impossible, you know. Um, later, we relocated back and I was able to um, get an opportunity at Broward, um, Broward, um, Broward Health, which is more of a corporate environment. So you're coming from like more of a relaxed area from where I was or where I had been, even though they're prestigious names, they were more relaxed in their settings. You know, when I got over to Broward, it was more of a corporate, it was more of a corporate environment and they had um, so many rules and you punch in at a certain time and, you know, you follow along with that. And I took all of what I had learned and started to pour it into um, acquiring my CPC, my pooling professionals certificate. And I literally, it's, fun, it's funny I tell the story. Um, I, I had, didn't take any courses for the CPT, CPC. I literally learned online at YouTube. I call it YouTube University. That's and awesome. so I, I started looking around get this, you know, I was piecing together this and piecing together that. And I was like, I really think I can get this. And um, I bought, I purchased the books because you have to have the CPC manual, you have to have um, the diagnosis, the ICD. At this time, fortunately for me, at this time, we were transitioning from ICD-9 to ICD-10. So mm -hmm. I was able to get fresh into ICD-10 and just take off running with that. I knew that that okay. right there was my opportunity. Okay. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the folks over at Broward didn't think ICD-10 was coming down the pike so fast, but I had, where I had friends back in Washington, D.C. that I kept connections with at George Washington University, and they were like, girl, get on this now because it's coming. It's coming. Obama said it, and it's coming, and so I was like, okay, let me, you know, I started scrambling and getting it together. Um, I sat down for the exam, 
And I didn't pass the first time around, but I was able to get a projective view of what was on the exam and what I needed to focus in on, right? So I went back home, I started studying again, I, you know, developed a couple of little study groups, um, but it all boiled down to me um, on how I was able to mark up my books, know what to focus on, and keep the rest of the information out of my scope of vision, right? And so I took that in and I was able to eventually pass the course, you know, and um, I remember, I remember when I got my scores back that I had passed. When I tell you I got on that grind, I was just like, I am out of this corporate and I am going for the gold, you know? Awesome. Awesome. And, um, and so that's, and that's, you know, I took a couple of twists and turns, you know, got some experience in, in actually coding. I connected with the group here in Weston, our Weston chapter of the AAPC, and got some really great mentors. I wound up being on the board um, of the AAPC chapter. And so that exposed me to a whole new group of folks. And um, and I and I found my way over to Acevedo Consultants, which was which had been a dream of mine. Like who wouldn't want to work? with under under Jean Acevedo it was it was just it was like all of my stars lined up and there I was yeah or here I am I say yeah amazing Ebony I was I listening hope I didn't just ramble on no but it was, no yeah. I'm listening to you so closely and you spoke so well you should be like a focused study for new coders, right? Who are trying to come into this. I listened to you so keenly and you really did take all the opportunities you could in the beginning and you recognized and took away so many strengths from starting in medical records, right? There's so much to glean from medical records departments and you took it all in, amazing. Then you moved on to collections, another vital department um, in the healthcare industry, right? So you took all of those skills and that's savvy as well, uh, and then moved on and upwards, right? It's incredible. And then your story about not taking a traditional um, CPC uh, course you learned it on YouTube. And this was back in the day. This was a long time ago, right? Now, today, flash forward in 2021, the YouTubers like my good friend, Victoria Mole, and so many others are YouTube educators for the new people to master their CPT or whatever, right? Types of coding sets, Hicks Picks, ICD-910, whatever, everything. So for you to have started on YouTube and found some nuggets back then is impressive. So bravo to you. Um, and you didn't just quit after that first attempt, right? This is great advice. This is a really good um, session with you because you really did hone in on all of the key factors of becoming a coder, um, a certified coder, right? You have to have that commitment persistence and passion, um, which all of my guests that I bring on, we all have that similar characteristic and trait. We all are that type of person. We're not going to give up and quit and go hide under some rock. We're going to keep going. So I love hearing about your journey, simply incredible and that you keep climbing. So amazing. Absolutely. Amazing, Ebony. I love it. I know my audience is going to eat this up eat this up. All right. So now you know what, you know, I'm all about working smarter for coding compliance and affecting change in this space of healthcare. But I want to continue hearing your voice. Like we heard in your bio, you are a consultant at Acevedo Consulting Incorporated. So how do providers come to you, Ebony? Are they shiny and new and trying to start practicing medicine on their own? Or have they come to you after someone on their team made a credentialing fumble? Can you provide us with your top tips for successfully setting your providers up? And of course, please let my listeners know if there's a difference, if any, between setting up for Medicare versus a big box commercial payer like a Blue Cross. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so 
Okay, so you when you're setting up for Medicare, Medicare or CMS pretty much sets the highest standard um, of what you want to have and what you want to set yourself up for um, when you are going through the compliance, when you're going through the credentialing phase of things. Um, and you were asking, I'm going to back up for a second because you were asking, um, did providers uh, come to us as, do providers come to us as new or when someone fumbles the ball? We get both. We get both ends of the spectrum. So I we do have clients that are just new starting out. They just um, either purchased a space or they're renting a space. Um, they've been doing, they've been a provider somewhere else and now they're off on their own or they're creating a group. Um, so we do get those providers and we walk them through the phases step by step of what it is that you need to do. Um, as far as Okay, first thing you need to do is to get your MPI number. Then the second thing you need to do, you know, to go through the steps, you know, you need to have all of your certifications, you know, when you are applying, you need to have your EFT information, that's your, your banking information of how you want to receive your funds. Um, and it, it's several things along the documentation phase that they need. And what we try to do, um, we um, speak in French because what I try to do <laughs> is submit all the documents that are requested at the time of the application. Because what I've noticed, especially with Medicare, is when you supply to them everything that they've asked you for, um, and, and some people call it dot your I's and cross your T's, but they give, a, they give you a list of what they are requiring. When you submit everything to them, um, they come back with a, a quick um, acceptance. You know, it's, it's pretty swift in how they move along. So I would say maybe 30 days or less has been the, been the process right now for the Medicare um, applications. But what I do notice is if you miss one thing, like I, I submitted um, a provider, a uh, nurse practitioner a couple of weeks ago. And, and, I, knew, and I knew that this was gonna come back, you know. Um, she sent the printout of her certification numbers um, that had came down from the state. Um, she supplied everything that she was supposed to supply except for the certification document itself, okay? So I went on, I submitted just what she had sent me. And just as I thought, I received a development letter back and a phone call stating, okay, we do have all of this and we appreciate all of this that you did turn in, but we do need the certification, the actual printout of the certification as well, or copy. And so what I had to do was just go, I had to reach back out to the nurse practitioner, which it delayed the process, you know, um, and then submitted, um, I didn't have to submit a whole new application. What I was able to do is just fax over the certification itself. And um, rapidly we received, you know, an approval letter. But what I would tell um, new providers and old, so for new providers that's adding, for new providers that's just coming in that want to get credential, everything that's listed on that last page of that Medicare application that they're asking for, you want to supply everything that they're asking for, um, if it applies to you, you know, like uh, one of the, one of the things that it asks you to supply is if you've had a felony and and you need to document that. So if you don't have, if you're not involved in that and you don't have that, there's a question on the application where you would just check no, like this doesn't apply to me. So of course, that's one of the documents you wouldn't have to supply. But when they're asking you for your basic information, you wanna supply everything that they're asking you for the first time out. That way you won't get hung up in having them to have to take a whole second look at your application. Because this is, they, they are feeding these things through, you know, and um, the first thing they looked at is, do you have everything that they're asking for, you know, so. Exactly. It's just such a complicated process. And, you know, I'm no expert on credentialing, which is why I thought it would be great to have you on here. Um, over the years of my work in this industry, I've come across so many cases where providers aren't credentialed properly 
and or enrolled, depending on what the payer is, right? So can you talk a little bit about the terminology that may be confusing um, some of my audience as well? What are the differences between the language of enrollment versus credentialing? Or is there a difference? Um, well, as far as um, credentialing is concerned, it, it's you're you're being credentialed. Like if we if we're still on the lines of Medicare, um, being credentialed is being credentialed through Medicare. Um, of course, you want to have all of your your documentation in place. I go back to that. So, like if you are in a special, if you're a specialty in a providership, you want to make sure you have all your certifications. You want to make sure that you have your. So, like for the state of Florida. Um, we have something called the Department of Health uh, license, or, and these are for the medical providers. So when you submit your application, you want to make sure that you have your license in place and you send them a copy of your license. Um, if you're going to be dealing with any drugs or prescribing any medications, you want to make sure you have your DEA. You know, you want to make sure you have that. And um and if there's anything else that they're asking for, so like you, when you said that the application process is um, complicated, it's really not. It's really not complicated. Um, it's just reading the application and providing what they are asking for. You know, um, so it's it's really no complication. Um, well, I guess to me, because <laughs> you're the expert right? at this point, I've done so <laughs> many applications. Right. Um, but it's really not a complicated, um, so it's really not a complicated thing. So I sat with um, one of the provider's assistants. We did a Zoom call like you and I are doing. And so she was really nervous. So a little older young lady, um, she was really nervous. Well, this is my first time. I don't know what to do. Um, I have a new provider that's coming on to our group. And so I explained to her that she needed an A55I um, and that's for the, the individual provider. And then she was also gonna need an 855R. And the 855R is reassigning the benefits um, to the group. And so she was like, well, why do I need to do two applications? You know, that was, she was freaking out over that. <laughs> and so, you know, when I, when I, did the screen flip and I showed her the screen and we went over each question. Um, it was so self-explanatory. Um, name of provider. Do you want to put the name of the provider? You know what I mean? Where they went, where they got their education from. You want to put the name of the edu education. They already have their MPI number. You want to put that there on um, the application as well. In, in the application, it asks, is, um, it asks for the Medicare provider number. Now, if the Medicare, if the provider is new and they've never been in Medicare system, then they won't have a provider number. So you, in that spot, we usually put pending in that spot because you're pending a new um, provider number, you know, it's so, so simple. It's just going down the list and answering the questions. Um, it's just the people, they, they see the applications and these pages and pages long. And so That's they just start freaking complicated, out. Complicated, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I walked her through the A55I mm -hmm. and I walked her through the A55R. She felt a little at ease. So a few days later, she got another provider that already had an A55I. They had a Medicare number already in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're coming from another state, then you leave that state or you terminate that state if you're no longer going to be providing service there. Okay. And then you have to apply for a new um, you have to apply with the new 855I here in the state of Florida. Um, and so, and, th and this is for any state that you're going to, you, you're not, you're not crossing Medicare numbers um, from, from state to state or from region to region because Medicare has regions. So, and I'm not going to sit and list those. So you can Google <laughs> those. So, um, so I explained to her, okay, so they are state of Florida. We're just going to need an A55R, okay? That's all we're going to need. So um, she was able to 
put all the information in. She sent it over to me. She was like, is this it? I'm like, I'm just so nervous. I don't know if I did this right. I was like, this is absolutely perfect. You answered all of the questions that they asked you for. That's it. That's all. This is, this is it. Just answer the questions that they're asking you for. And so she began to feel a little at ease um, and was able to submit the application. Well, I love it. You have a way of putting uh, providers at ease. So I'm going to send more providers your way because I've only heard, yeah, because I've only heard about, like I said, the complexities are probably in those pages and pages, right? Once you print them out, it seems to be a very complex process. So do you recommend um, that this type of enrollment, at least for Medicare and Medicaid, do you recommend that providers do it online or do you recommend that they do print it out, hand write everything and then put things in the mail? Like what, what steps do you take? So you're not gonna write anything in, especially on, you're not gonna write anything in on any of the applications. So what you would do is you would download the application from their website and you would type it all in to the selections um, with the, a PDF format and Mm -hmm. a PDF format that would allow you to input the information, right? And then um, for Florida, they give you the option to just upload the application to their website. And that's the best way to do it in Florida. And so what Florida does is when they upload the application to the website, they send you back a confirmation through your email. So you have something to track your your progress of the application with. I noticed that um, I do have a couple of Chicago clients that I'm working with um, that I have to mail in their Mm -hmm. applications, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when I mail in their applications, um, I make sure I get a tracking number off the USPS and I make sure that I send it in and, and I get documentation that it's been received. And so I know then that I can start tracking the application from that part. Um, but the application is not, um, it's, it's printed out once you fill in the application and it's, and it's not printed out for Florida, it's printed out for the other regions. Um, now they do have this system called uh, PECOS Mm -hmm. Um, where if the provider themselves wants to go in and attempt to fill out, like I said, attempt, Mm -hmm. attempt to fill out the applications, they, or, or if they have someone working in a group that can fill out the application. As of yet, we haven't been um, doing PECOS um, just for other reasons, but we haven't been doing PECOS. Um, We started to at one point, um, but it hasn't been followed through with. And so right now we're just doing ap- applications, um, the printable applications or the uploadable applications. Um, now you asked also as far as Medicaid. So Medic- So I've only dealt with Medicaid in the state of Florida as okay. of now. Okay. Um, with them, you have an application process that you go through on their website um, and you go in and you fill out the application. It's, 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 it's explanatory. Everything that they're asking you for, you provide the information for that. Then once you get to the end of the application, it's asking you for a list of things that you need to upload along with the application. And, um, and the upload process is just as easy as filling out the application itself. Wonderful, Ebony. My goodness, you have so many key points for providers to make sure that they understand. And it is a simple process. It's not as complicated. It's not as complicated as they make. And, and they I, make, think yeah. what, I think what Acevedo has done is been exceptional because what they've done for me is when I go to um, request the information from the providers, they give me an application. Acevedo provides me with an application of questions that are asked for the applications that we're going to submit. It also, it also um, in the information request forms, it documents what they need to provide to go along with the application. So it, it takes out the whole delay process mm-hmm. because once you, once you know the provider that you're working with or, or the provider itself, you, you're going to ask all the questions that's going to be asked on the application itself you know, and then you'll be able to just put all of that information in at the time that they provided to you, along with the documents that they send along with it. 
Perfect. It's like a little roadmap that just helps the whole process be a little smoother. Mm-hmm. I love it. That's wonderful, Ebony. Thank you so much for making it um, much easier for people to understand. Yeah, and I, I know you you mentioned um, Medicare in comparison to Blue Cross Blue Shield. Now, uh, with Blue Cross Blue Shield, we we don't work with commercial payers at okay. this time. Okay. And so we've only been dealing with the um, the government agencies, the Medicare, Medicaid. Um, but CMS is the high standard. Mm-hmm. So if CMS is the high standard, you want to make sure that you are supplying the other commercials with at least what CMS is asking you for. Absolutely. So it's important for providers or their team, whoever helps them, um, look up those Blue Cross Blue Shield insurances on the internet, right? And follow whatever their uh, credentialing or enrollment processes are, their applications that they have online, and just follow them to the T, right? Yeah. Wonderful, Ebony. Thank you. So good. So good to hear an expert talk about credentialing. Thank you. And put us all at ease. I love it. I love it. Now, I know you're going to have to go, but for my last question, okay, I want to know what is it you're still striving for, Ebony? Where am I going to see you in the next five years? Absolutely. Um, Right now, um, my title at Acevedo is called a coding and compliance analyst. Um, I am CPC certified. Um, there is, um, another credentialing, another certification that I do need to obtain. Um, and so I'm working towards obtaining that. Um, and, and I would like for my title to change to a consultant. Um, that's my goal. Like I, I just, I'm so excited to become a consultant. Um, not that it will free up any of my time because <laughs> I know, I know that once I do become a consultant, it's, it's, it's going to add more to my plate. But um, my initial goal for coming on with Acevedo was to be an actual consultant. And so I definitely look forward to that. Um, I do, that is my five-year plan to go into that direction. And I also, I love to travel. And so just recently, um, as you know, Mm -hmm. I traveled to London and Paris um, back in September and, um, and that just opened my mind to a whole new opportunity that's out there. Um, and I would like to continue to travel. I know um, coming soon, um, I have a friend that's having a wedding in Kenya. Oh and my so, goodness, uh, amazing. I can't wait to ask for oh PTO for that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Start planning yeah. it now. Oh, Absolutely. wow. Absolutely, yeah. And it's coming really soon. So um, I sent out to have my passport renewed. It came back sad. It came back yesterday. And so I'm ready to just take oh, off. Oh, you're ready to go. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes. Amazing. And then um, I plan to do skydiving in Dubai. And, um, and that's, where, that's where my projection is, you know, for the next five years. I definitely want to travel the world. Did you say skydiving in Dubai? Skydiving in Dubai. Oh, I, did, wow. I did skydiving here in Florida, but um, my mind is set on skydiving in Dubai. And even if I oh, just man. go to skydive and stay for a day or two and then come back, come all the way back home I'm just I have that's what I have my hope set on so I'm so excited about that I'm an adrenaline jockey so You're an adrenaline jockey I love it no you can do anything I'm excited to see you become a consultant in the next five years and keep on traveling worldwide amazing amazing Ebony I'm so happy you invited me today I really appreciate your show and everything that you're doing for the healthcare community. Um, we love you at our team. You have been such a resource of information. And, and I know this interview is supposed to be about me, but I just want to give you your flowers while you're around. And, um, and I just thank you. I thank you for being open to communicate with me, especially when you came down um, and you allowed me to take you out. We had, we had a great time. Um, but I, I really appreciate you. And I thank you for all that you're doing for us. Wonderful, Ebony. Thank you so much. Now, you know what? Before you go, 
Would it be all right if I leave in my show notes how folks can get in touch with you at Acevedo Consulting? Can I do that? Absolutely. Um, in the near future, I'll, I, I know I put together a YouTube channel and I started the process of going through um, the CPC certification. Um, so I do have one video on there to where they can look um, to at least to see the books that they need to um, sit for the exams for. And I plan to do a series. Um, so I'll give you, I'll, I'll send you my YouTube information and also my email address and contact information. They absolutely can contact me. And, and any providers out there that are just fearful of the application process um, for the Medicare or Medicaid, I would enjoy helping you with that. Absolutely, Ebony. I'm going to make sure I put everything in my show notes and absolutely any providers that come my way for credentialing are going straight to you. So don't be afraid. I will send them all your way because you're the pro. So thank you so much. Oh, absolutely, Ebony. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You too. And now it's time for my best practice tips in trusty tip. So in today's new back to basics compliance tip, I wanted to focus on the new CPT 2022 coding manual, the professional edition that just got delivered to my door. Yep, it's another late package, but that's okay. It's finally here and my enthusiasm in opening it never gets old. It never fades. So today's back to basics applies to me as well, right? All the basics I go through year after year, every autumn season when CPT arrives. What I could do without, however, is vacuuming up all that paper snow. My book this year is a bit out of control, in my opinion, in the amount, page after page, the paper snow is everywhere. Now, I know I've shared code updates in previous episodes, all the updates the AMA posts on their website that allow us to scribble scrawl notes until the new manual arrives. Well, it's here, and I love seeing the 249 new codes right there printed. I love seeing the new Appendix Q and new Appendix R. I need to really take the time to scour through each and every section. I need to take the time to transfer any meaningful notes from my previous 2021 edition as needed. I also plan on paying particular attention to the Category 3 CPT codes with the expansion of the Proprietary Laboratory Analyses section. What are you planning on focusing on? So, I hope this Back to Basics on the CPT 2022 Coding Manual has proved to be important. It's fundamental that you make sure you're slowing down and reading the new manual before the code sets implementation and effective date of January 1st, 2022. The AMA gives us time in advance, year after year. They publish new codes or new categories or new instruction on their website in advance of publication. To my recollection, only the past two years have had a slight delay in shipping. Of course, this is due to the coronavirus pandemic. Regardless, There's still plenty of time to really roll up our sleeves and get to the work of understanding what all of these new codes, there's 249 of them, remember, as well as new deletions, there's 63, as well as the new revisions, there's 93 of those. And what do they all mean for 2022? So when the documentation paints the medical picture with clarity, and vibrancy from the onset of care, a certified medical coder can then abstract all the new codes with accuracy. And finally, in this week's inspiring quote in Spark is from Aristotle. It is during our darkest moments that we must focus to see the light. So very true, right? I think this is a perfect quote that reminds us, inspires us on the significance of illumination. This impactful statement reveals the power of illumination. 
This statement shows us that even when we are struggling, waffling about in the darkness, in the uncertainty of our lives, there is a power in our ability to focus, to hone in on the light. I think this is an incredible quote that allows us to remember that we all have faced hardship, have seen the darkness at some point in our lives. I think Aristotle's words allow us to see the light is always there. It is always within. I am happy Aristotle's spark still burns brightly in all of us today. So that wraps up today's episode. Please go out and make this a great day, an incredible week for yourselves. Aim a little higher, do a little more, and give back in any way you can in 2021. There's so much each one of us can do. Now, in my final note today, remember, it's that time of year. So please, please start thinking about feeding the hungry in your communities. Offer to gift a family or two or three in need this holiday season. As always, I appreciate you diving into today with me. And if you want more information from me, go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes below. Please continue staying safe and healthy. Practice safety for one and all during our collective seemingly never ever ending life and times of coronavirus. Thank you so much for listening in on today's very special episode. And I hope every week with me brings you closer to helping your providers paint a masterpiece. See you next Wednesday. Oh, 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 oh,